Good morning, folks. We've got 10 of the top science stories here for April 10th. We'll cover a range of fields and topics, and as always, we're starting with our star at spaceweathernews.com. We find the last 24 hours were relatively calm on the sun. Active regions still developing in multiple places, but we're too early in the sunspot cycle for larger flares. The brief coronal hole stream we had endured is now over after it failed to produce much more than minor geomagnetic instability. The peak was 36 hours ago, and since then, we have seen calming conditions prevailing. We're going right to the articles here, and there's an excellent new study on the inefficiency of spraying the sky with sulfate particles. It's not going to have the desired effects on cloud reflectivity, and moreover, it is just a terrible idea to go up and try to play God in the sky. Up next, we're watching the birth and death of an El Nino. The modeling of the ENSO pattern, El Nino and La Nina, is one of the critical drivers of atmospheric variability in the world. And until now, believe it or not, they were not using salinity or saltiness of the ocean for their forecasts and analyses. This has recently changed and is representing a veritable boom in forecasting science surrounding the ocean-atmosphere heat exchange around the world. A pinch of salt gets you a better tasting dish or a better forecast model for ENSO. Speaking of the atmosphere-ocean exchanges, we've got a study coming out and predicting that the oceans will not be as able to take in carbon as they had believed. But we've got the Yale-backed Woods Hole team suggesting that their processes are actually far more efficient than we realized. And that's because while humans have found ways to turn excess caloric access into a health crisis and a leading cause of death in the world, the rest of the animals on this planet see more food, eat more food, and they thrive. Up next, let's go out to space and we're going to the TRAPPIST-1 system. Like a massive Jovian system, it could fit within Mercury's orbit, but it contains some of the most intriguing worlds we've ever seen from Earth, including numerous Earth-like planets that may host liquid water, either on the surface or below. Today, we're hearing that there's virtually no dust in or around the system, which they suggest means that it was all pulled in to form the planets, so the gorgeous, Trappist-driven imaginations of astronomy fans the world over is built from dust. And speaking of Jovian-like objects, you don't need to get much bigger than Jupiter and you've got a brown dwarf star. We're learning that the NRAO has managed to clock the winds on the star planet half-breed. Its winds are screaming. The atmosphere of the brown dwarf rotates faster than the sphere below, leaving 650 meter per second winds tearing around, which is over a thousand miles an hour. We do not know about any differential rotation or equatorial counterflows, but at least at the Earth's mid-latitude areas, the winds would seem to match what they are seeing on this brown dwarf. Up next, folks. They are claiming that between the light that escapes an active galactic nucleus and that which cannot escape, there is a thin window of those who get an ankle grabbed and gets whipped back down to collide with the disk. They are saying that the light then bounces off and escapes to be seen by observers here at Earth. But for me, this is a big presumption about a brightening in the disk. It could be a stellar event, a collision, the plasma torus, or any other number of energetic phenomena. But this is what we've got today. Now something a bit more solid here. To fully grasp what I tried to explain about the importance of the expansion fail study we shared yesterday, let Bonn and Harvard conclusions ring in layman's terms. You just can't imagine how much space science has proceeded from that premise of uniform expansion, and if it's not so, they've got the entire universe wrong. Link below. Let's switch gears a bit here and go down under to find evidence of some of the oldest oral traditions ever. They now believe the aboriginal volcano tales rival the Indian legends that go back more than 20,000 years, in this case, to an amazing 36,000 years ago. Would be one of the oldest stories in existence, if not the oldest, and it likely describes the upheaval from the great event three disaster cycles ago. And last but not least, if it was the galactic sheet interaction with our star that caused past events, we should be able to see its increasing warp effect on the disk as you move out. And so we look outwards from the sun opposite the direction of the galactic center, and yes, we can pick out the variations, the waves up and down. This is the most critical aspect of modern galactic science because of what must happen to the sun when it crosses that sheet. The answer? Cosmic disaster. Link to the playlist is found below this video in the description box, and we greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our star to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow right here, but right now it's 4.20 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.